Welcome to our Girl Scouts exclusive Valentine's Day tasting. My name is Lauren. I'll be the host for this tasting, and then I will introduce a few special guests that we have. Um, just right off the bat, I know if some of you have done this before, it hasn't always been where you can turn on and off your camera. However, um, this time we have a small enough group where you can all turn on your camera if you'd like and unmute yourself as much as you'd like. I'll be monitoring that just to make sure it's quiet for everyone throughout the tasting um, without any like background noises. But if you do have a question, feel free to unmute yourself and ask any of our panelists that we have on tonight. So we have Tammy Jo as our chocolatier and she'll be going through all the pieces. We also will have Zandra and Morgan at the very end. They both work for Mars Ridley. Zandra is our quality conformance coordinator. So in short, she makes sure that all the pieces in the packaging are perfect before it arrives to you. And then Morgan is our microbiologist for the global quality and food safety team. So in short, uh, means that the food that you get is safe to eat as well. So both amazing women doing amazing things for Mars Ridley, as well as Tammy Jo. So we will introduce them at the very end for any Q and A's that you have for them. I know we got sent over a few and then um, if you can think of anything throughout the taste and feel free to type it into the text or the chat box and we can answer some questions at the very end as well. Cause they both are, all three of them are very talented and we're happy to have them with Mars Ridley. So we can go ahead and get into the tasting. Again, make sure you're muted throughout the tasting if you don't have any questions. If you do, definitely unmute so you can ask any of them a question. Um, my name is Lauren, like I said, and we will get right into who we are as a company. So Ethel M Chocolates, if you haven't heard of us before, um, we were started by Forrest Mars Sr., who's in that top left photo. Him and his father, Frank, actually started the Mars chocolate company together, which they made, you know, m and Skittles, Twix, um, Snickers, all of your favorite candies. I'm sure you've tried all of them, hopefully. Um, so they made that huge company and then Forrest retired and moved to Henderson um, and then got a little bored in retirement and thought to himself, you know, I feel like I'm not really a true chocolatier until I have my own gourmet boxed chocolate line. So he started making chocolate again using his mother's recipes. And in 1981, he opened our factory, Ethel M. Chocolates, naming it after his mother, Ethel. So you'll see in that top middle photo is our factory. Um, I would love to know if anyone has visited us before or heard of us before. Um, just leave a quick chat in the, leave a quick comment in the chat box if you've heard of us or if you visited us before. That would be amazing to hear. We have a 4.4 acre cactus garden. Those two photos on the right show it in spring. It's so beautiful. If you haven't been, definitely encourage you to come out if you're in the Vegas area. It's free and open to the public. And we also, in the winter time, decorate the entire garden with over a million LED lights. So it's a really pretty winter wonderland. And you'll see in that bottom middle photo, just a little snippet of it, but it's so pretty. Um, it's fun to just walk around and have hot chocolate and you're in the garden with all the lights. Um, the last thing I wanna mention is our solar panel garden. That's awesome, Vivian. Welcome, or thanks for visiting us. That's so much fun. We do do chocolate tastings on site. So we do chocolate tastings. And if you're over 21, we do chocolate and wine tastings, which are very fun. Um, so the bottom left photo is our solar panel garden. And that is three acres of solar panels. You can kind of see it in that photo. It stretches out three acres and it's just behind our cactus garden. So if you're visiting us, you can actually see it. And because we have those solar panels means that we can power our factory during its peak production hours, during sunlight hours, of course. So the sun will power and basically make the chocolate during sunlight hours, which is really amazing to think about that the chocolate that you're eating today was made um, with the help of solar power energy. So I want to go ahead and introduce your chocolatier, Tammy Jo. She has been with us for over 20 years or just about 20 years. Uh, once she was old enough, she applied, fascinated with machines and how they work. So she started off in the factory store. I mean, in the, um, in the factory side, giving tours and learning about how all the machines 
work and how they make all of our pieces. And then she transferred over to the retail side where she now trains new associates. She hosts these tastings daily and also in-person ones. So without further ado, I will hand it over to Tammy Jo. Hello everybody. My name is Tammy Jo and as Lauren said, I have been with the company for 20 years and I am an expert at eating chocolate. So we're gonna be sharing with you all of the fun facts that we have learned along the way. And the most important is how to eat. It's gonna make a huge difference. Uh, so feel free to ask any questions. The hard ones I love, I appreciate them because that means if I don't know the answer, I will do some more research. And then that way, next time someone asks, I will have the answer. So it helps me if you ask the hard questions. Uh, so far, I've, most of the time I don't get stumped, but I welcome the challenge, okay? So be creative, ask whatever questions you'd like. <clears throat> All right, so we're gonna get started with how to eat our chocolate properly. So what is gonna make it so different compared to how we normally eat it? I don't know about you guys, but sometimes when I eat chocolate, I just grab it and shove it in my face and, I'm, and then it's gone. And then I'm like, did I eat chocolate? I feel like I need more. So we're not gonna do that today. We're gonna slow it down and we're gonna eat chocolate very, very slowly but we're gonna think about every single detail about that chocolate before we even eat it. We're going to look at it. We're going to feel of it. We're going to smell it first. So the first thing you wanna do is pick it up and really look at each piece and think about how do they get the design on there? How do they get the filling inside the chocolate and all of those different factors. And then you're gonna smell your chocolate. Smelling is 80% of your taste. So by smelling something, you're really heightening all of that flavor and what you're trying to do is smell past the chocolate. We already know it's gonna smell like chocolate, but what else do you smell on that piece? Each piece is gonna have a little bit of a different smell. Try to figure out if you can smell whether it has fruit or does it have nuts or is it, is it dark chocolate, is it milk chocolate? What are the differences between the smells? Really think about that. And then taste, right? And when we take a bite, we wanna to try to do at least two to three bites. We're gonna take a bite, chew a couple of times, Push it up to the roof of your mouth and let it melt away slowly and think about the different texture and how it melts and what flavors you're noticing in each piece. And then as you finish the piece, we'll talk about how each piece is made and feel free to ask any questions about any of our other chocolates. Um, all right, so without further ado, let's get into the placemat and how we're gonna use that. So the placemat is to help you identify what your favorite piece is. As we go along the tasting, it tends, I tend to notice that people say, oh, this is my favorite when they try the first piece. It's so good, I love it. And then they try the second piece and they're like, no, 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 this one's my favorite. So it's very hard to determine which one is your number one favorite. So this is really fun to kind of rate the pieces, write down thoughts and feelings about what you liked on each piece. And then the flavor wheel is gonna help you identify what flavor you think it goes into. And each piece goes into more than one category. So the best part about this is there is no wrong answer. Everybody tastes things differently because we're all different. So if you taste fruity, then maybe it tastes fruity to you. Whereas somebody else might notice maybe floral notes or maybe there's an earthy tone and somebody else might notice just the roasted flavor. So it's really kind of fun to share that um, with the people that you're eating it with and you know with the group if you'd like to. Uh, so that when you say something like that, like, oh, I taste fruity, well, then the other people might start tasting fruit too. So it's kind of fun to share that. Um, all right, so without further ado, we're gonna dive on into our first piece of chocolate, and then we're gonna get started into the fun facts about chocolate in general and how it's created. All right. Up first is our white chocolate. So go ahead and pick that one up and then take a look at it and think about, you know, how it's shaped, how do they get that design on there? It kind of looks like as if we carved the chocolate and we carved Ethel M on that piece, right? Do you see the little design on there? Very delicate. So now what we're gonna do, if you, if you have a hard time smelling sometimes, you can rub the bottom of the piece, so it warms it up and releases the aroma and then cup it and Take a deep breath in of the chocolate and really smell the chocolate. Try to notice all the different flavors you're getting from it. Does it smell like cooked milk? Does it smell buttery? All right, so now what we're gonna do, this is kind of silly, but it's really fun and feel free to do it throughout the whole tasting if you want to. 
we're going to hold our nose shut. We're going to plug our nose. Look as if you're going underwater for the first time and you don't want any water in your nose. You're going to plug it really tight and take a bite. Push it up to the roof of your mouth and let it melt. And then release your nose. So if anybody would like to share, I'd like to know what you tasted when your nose was plugged versus what you taste when your nose is unplugged. I think the taste is a little bit more muted. So you don't exactly get to taste it as well as you do without. And it just kind of feels like the taste is a little bit more muted. Awesome, thank you. You're absolutely right. The reason for that is because when your nose is plugged, you're only using like 20%. So you're barely tasting it. And then when you release your nose, all of a sudden your smell comes back and all your taste comes back. And so it's more intense and you're gonna notice more flavor. So let's take a look at the flavor wheel and think about all the different flavors that we notice from that flavor wheel. So for me, I always notice like butter. It kind of has like a buttery texture to it. And because of that texture, it kind of reminds you of butter, but it also has a very strong hint of vanilla and almost kind of like a caramel. So it definitely goes into sweet aromatics. And then a little bit of the roasted, but not that much because there's no cacao in this piece. A lot of people ask questions about what is white chocolate? Is it a real chocolate? Is it not chocolate? What is it? Um, so white chocolate really is chocolate. But what we do is we separate the cocoa butter from the cocoa bean. And we're going to get into more detail on that a little bit later on. But just to you know, clarify, we have to have at least 20% cocoa butter in a white chocolate to be called white chocolate. Otherwise, it's just a white confection or it might say on the label white coating or white chocolate flavored. That's basically indicating that it doesn't have enough cocoa butter to be considered a white chocolate. All right. So while you guys are enjoying that piece, I will go ahead and talk to you about how this is made. So the shape of this piece is a little heart. That is a molded piece. It's gonna be a solid. So when you bite into it, you might've heard like a nice snap to the chocolate. And that's because it's a solid chocolate. Hold on one second. Sorry for the echoing. I just logged in to my laptop too, so I can see more of your awesome faces because I love seeing everybody. There it is, now I can see everyone. Cool. Alrighty. So this is going to go through a process called the one shot depositor where it does the filling and the chocolate shell all in one shot. Now this piece, because it's just a solid, only half the tank will be filled. So I'll kind of draw in the air what it looks like. So there's basically two tanks. One will have the chocolate shell and one will have the filling if we're doing a filling. But this one is just gonna be solid. So only one tank is filled with the white chocolate. And then there's like a tube and then a tube that goes inside. So if we're doing something with a filling, we can do the filling on the chocolate shell all at once. Or if we're doing a solid like the, this one here, it's all filled with white chocolate and it just shoots down into the mold, it takes 60 seconds per mold to fill the entire mold. And then from there, it goes through a cooling tunnel. Fun fact, our cooling unit, I don't know if some of you have been to our factory. So just a few fun facts, the molding process actually holds 500 molds. And so one batch of, a cream, like a lemon cream, would be about 10,000 pieces. All right, so now we're gonna get into some fun facts about the cacao trees. So cacao trees can only grow 20 degrees north and south of the equator in the dark shaded areas you see on the map, South America, West Africa, and parts of Asia. However, there is one state that can produce the tree 
and the fruit that can grow the tree and produce the fruit on the tree. Can anybody guess what state that is? It's got to be 20 degrees below and above the equator in a very tropical, warm environment. A state in Minnesota, or sorry, not Minnesota, in the U.S.? Yes. Is it like is it Florida? Florida is very close, but Hawaii? not quite. Hawaii? Mm -hmm. Did someone say Hawaii? I did. Yes, good job. It is Hawaii, absolutely. Hawaii has that perfect environment. It's right in between the equator, 20 degrees below and above. So it has 80 degree weather year round, no season. So it's the perfect environment for cacao trees. So now we're gonna dive deeper into the details about the tree and how it grows and, and how it produces the fruit. My favorite fun fact about the cacao tree is that the pod is considered the fruit of the tree. And I kind of twist that to my advantage and then say chocolates are fruit. <laughs> it's not true, but why take the risk? Anyways, <laughs> when the trees bloom, the flowers will cover the entire tree from the trunk all the way up into the branches. And most fruit trees don't do this. So the flowers are actually very tiny. They're very, very small. They almost look like miniature orchids. And the only bug that can pollinate the flower is a midge. And the reason why is because it's small enough to get down inside the flower to pollinate. Once pollinated, it takes four to six months to grow a full size pod. So they can roughly do about two harvests a year. And this is like the size and shape of it. It's kind of like the size of a small Nerf football. And they have to use a machete to cut off the tree and to crack it open. Now I have another trivia question for you guys. Each pod, has 25 to 60 beans, okay? 25 to 60 beans. How many pods do you think it would take to make one pound of chocolate? I'd say about, like, do you know how many beans it takes? Is that like? Yeah, if you wanna go by bean, you can. So uh, I know the answer to that too. So somebody guessed four, someone guessed 40, I think 47 in the I chat. I feel like it would be a lot because it kind of feels like a trick question to me. <laughs> um, I mean, I'd say maybe like 50 or 60. Okay. Do you mean like the pod or the beans? A pod. Okay. So we got 50 or 60. What other guesses do we got? I'm gonna check, I'm gonna open up my chat box really quick so I can see if anyone. We got 62. 7. So the beans roughly are the size of an almond, to give you an idea. And there's 25 to 60 beans in each pod. So the answer is 10. 10 pods to make one pound of chocolate. So seven was the closest without going over. All right, awesome. So now we're gonna get into uh, fermentation. How do we prep the beans? The first part of prepping is of course, harvesting them off the tree. So we use a machete to cut them off, we crack them open, we scoop out the beans with all that pulp. The pulp is very important during fermentation. So we keep all that pulp on. And to give you an idea of what that feels like when you're touching it, it's basically like touching pumpkin seeds. When you're carving a pumpkin, if you've ever carved a pumpkin, it feels like that. Or if you've had like mango and it has kind of like that slimy kind of texture to it, it's kind of like that. So once they go into fermentation, what happens is they sit in the sun in a big giant heap in a box and it basically breaks down all the sugar in the pulp and changes the acidity of the bean because it's sitting out in the heat and they rotate it every now and then. After that, if it gets done fermenting, then we go to the sun drying table where they're gonna spread it out in a thinner layer on a bamboo table. And that's because they want it to aerate. They want to dry it out. So they're constantly flipping it around throughout the day to make sure they get rid of all the excess moisture in the bean. So we're going to pause for bean talk and we're going to jump back into eating. So let's go ahead. Oh, excuse me. <laughs> let's go ahead and eat some more chocolate. Remember to cleanse your palate if you haven't already. And the next piece we're gonna be having is our milk chocolate heart. Which this one, one has that, that 
Is that the lighter one or the? Yes, it's the 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 lighter colored. Okay. Yeah. So in a tasting, what you want to do so you don't overwhelm your palate is you're going to go from light to dark. So if you ever get confused on that while we're going through, just remember light to dark. So we had the white one. Now we're going to have the milk chocolate. And then the next one's going to be the dark chocolate. So remember to smell and really think about what did that first one smell like compared to this one. OK, so it smell really different. So again, rub it if you want to to warm it up and then cup it and smell. So what are the differences? What else do you, you smell compared to the last piece? It kind of smells more, it smells a little bit more like chocolate. The white one smells a little bit more like vanilla to me and it had a very strong scent of vanilla. This one just kind of like smells like regular like chocolate chips. Exactly. Or like anything like that. Right. And then, of course, when you smell the dark one, you're going to see a big difference, too. So the higher the percentage of chocolate, the darker, more roasted flavors you might get. So, of course, whenever you guys are ready, you can go ahead and take your bites. Let's go ahead and do that. Awesome. I see some of you doing the nose trick. It's really fun to do that. Is this semi-sweet milk chocolate or is this, this like one, So our, all of our milk chocolate is going to be about 34%. Milk chocolate's usually not called a bittersweet um, because it's more on the sweet side. So when it gets into a higher cocoa content, like a dark chocolate, that's when they start talking about a semi-sweet. So um, this one is a pretty strong milk chocolate compared to other chocolates. It does have a pretty high... Uh, cocoa content, we use about 34%. And a fun fact is to be called milk chocolate, to be marketed as a milk chocolate piece, it has to have at least 10% cacao in the chocolate. And then of course it can go higher depending on how you want to make it. And again, we're going to get into more details on that in a little bit later, but that's the starting point of, of milk chocolate is 10% of the cacao solid and then of course it can go higher and we use 34 for our milk chocolate. So let's talk about those flavor notes, right? It was very similar to the first one, but it also had a little bit more extra flavor to it, right? It definitely goes into dairy again. It's kind of milky and creamy, more like cooked milk because if maybe you're making hot chocolate on the stove and the smell of cooked milks in the air, it kind of reminds me of that, but it also has kind of like a roasted flavor to it. You're getting more cacao because there's actual cacao beans in it, not just cocoa butter. And then of course it does have a hint of vanilla in there, a little bit of a caramel flavor. And you can get the caramel flavor because of the way they have to make milk chocolate. It goes through a crumb oven process. And basically what that means is they're kind of like using a pressurized oven to kind of blend the chocolate beans and the milk together because you can't just take milk and like pour it in. It has to be like a milk powder. And they use a compressed oven to kind of like mix that together. And what happens is it kind of caramelizes some of the milk in the chocolate. And that's why you get kind of a little caramel flavor to your milk chocolate piece. Uh, this one's made the same way as the white chocolate. It is the same mold. So you might've noticed the design is exactly the same because we use the same mold for this piece too. So it's gonna go through that one shot depositor where it does the filling and shot all at once, except for this one's just a solid. So we're gonna use all solid chocolate, but there's two different ways to do a molding process. There's also what we call a flood mold. So if it were to have a very uh, thin filling in it, they do with a flood mold. And what that does is basically they take the mold, they flood it with chocolate, and then it fills up, right? Then they flip it upside down and all the chocolate falls out. And what remains is a very thin layer of chocolate. Then they cool that, flip it over and put a filling in. So that's for anything that has like a really thin, delicate shell, maybe like a truffle or something like that. Any questions so far? What do they do with the extra chocolate after they dump it out? Very so good question. Uh, so what happens is when the machine flips over, it's actually going directly over a big tank full of chocolate that's causing 
there's like a pump in the tank and it pumps the chocolate up to this trough that's gonna dump it. And then this, the mold will move over and uh, right above the tank where the chocolate is. So when it flips over, all the chocolate falls back down into the tank and nothing is wasted. And we have a couple, uh, there's a piece that we're having today at the kind of towards the end that also goes through a different process. And uh, we have a really cool picture of that coming up. All right, so let's go ahead and cleanse our palettes if we're done with that piece. Again, if you guys have any questions, feel free to let me know. Should we be filling up our chart? Yeah, if you wanna write down on your chart like what each piece looked like and you know what you thought the texture was like. Um, uh, I didn't get a chart. Oh, sorry about that. Or I don't have one. Yeah. Sorry about that if you're missing your, your placemat. Um, but if you'd like, you could always just get a little piece of paper and it's kind of like write notes on what you thought about each piece. Um, did you I mean, guys I, notice? Oh, go ahead. I have a placemat like. Yeah, if you want to hold I it up. This placemat, but I don't oh, have okay. a, but I don't have like the Oh, charts. all right. Yeah, that one is what I'm not quite sure. Maybe they ran out or something. I'm really sorry for that you didn't get your little placemat. But if you did, there's like little spots on it where you can kind of put like texture, taste, overall impression, and you can write those down if you'd like. So up next, we have our dark chocolate. So this one looks a lot different compared to the white and the milk, right? And it's gonna be that same mold. It's gonna be made the same way. Um, so when you smell it, really think about like how different does it smell, right? Ding. Cheers. <laughs> 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 And listen too, you'll notice like it has a nice snap to it. I kind of take a bigger bite of this one because I love dark chocolate. <laughs> Do you ever get tired of eating chocolate? I love that question. Um, no. <laughs> a lot of people ask me that question and I eat chocolate every day and I do have to limit how much I eat though because you you shouldn't have too much and my dentist is always telling me I eat too much chocolate <laughs> um, but I love it and I never get tired of it well I'm actually going to share a funny little story about me um, and uh, my favorite chocolate so my favorite chocolate of Ethel M's that we make is the Coconut Delight. And I believe, let's see. It's this one right here. This is what it looks like. It's like a shredded coconut covered in a rich dark chocolate. That's my number one favorite piece. And a long time ago, we used to have to go into the factory to get supplies because we used to make like caramel apples and stuff like that. So I'd have to go into the kitchen to get the caramel. And one day I went in there and they were making my favorite piece, the coconut delight. And so I walked by and I was like, hey, like, what are you going to do with that box of scrap? And they're like, oh, if you want, you can have it. I was like, oh, cool. So they gave me the whole box and normally packed. This box has about five layers or four or five labor layers. And that no, it does not. I like it, but <laughs> it holds about 144 pieces. Keep that in mind. Uh-oh, uh -oh. Can you hear me now? Okay. <laughs> so normally a stock box holds about 144 pieces and so this box had no layers in it. So I don't know how much pieces were actually in the box, but normally packed it holds 144 pieces, okay? 
I took that box up to my coworkers. There was about five of us. I was like, hey, we can eat as much as we want. And they said we could take a, like a small bag home if we'd like. And so at the end of the day, I noticed there was only three pieces left in the box. So I thought I'll finish off the box so I can throw it away. Well, I didn't realize was that the next day I asked my coworkers, how much chocolate did you guys take home? Because it was a pretty big box. And they said they didn't take any, which means I ate the whole box myself. <laughs> So after that day, I was like, okay, I got to stop eating so much chocolate in one day. So I usually eat about five a day. I have a question. Yeah. How many chocolates do you think the factory produces in one day? Very good question. Um, if we needed to, the factory can produce over two tons of chocolate a day. Yeah. Yep. So like one batch of lemon satin cream makes 10,000 pieces. Okay. <laughs> but yo, are you wearing this shirt? I'm sorry, what? So, so far, which one did you guys like the best? Did you like the white, the milk, or the dark chocolate? Milk, white, milk, and dark. Ooh, cool. To me, I feel like the dark chocolate, like the taste doesn't go out of my mouth. And so the taste just like, to me, it kind of tastes like coffee. And I'm not a big fan of coffee. And so it doesn't really like, I kind of like the flavor only if it's mixed with something like caramel because I really yes. like caramel. And, but when it's just like plain, I normally don't like it. But at the same time, my mom absolutely loves it. So, I mean, kind of like that. But it just tastes like a very strong taste of coffee with a hint of chocolate. And I don't really like that, but I can't get the flavor out of my mouth, which <laughs> I don't like. Right? I know. We have a few pieces that are totally going to change that flavor for you, okay? Um, so I think it's interesting you mentioned coffee. So, yes, coffee and chocolate actually grow in the same area, which is quite interesting. And it does have kind of like that roasted flavor, like a coffee does. Um, I love coffee. <laughs> and I, so I love dark chocolate too, but I didn't always like dark chocolate. And I definitely feel that I've built up a tolerance over the years. Cause again, I've been working uh, for Ethel M for 20 years. So I started as just a milk chocolate person. Then I started liking white chocolate. And then I started getting into the darker, more bolder flavors. And now everything chocolate I love, <laughs> especially the dark, the darker, the better. Okay, what brand is your least favorite? Oh, you're not um, that's a very good question. I don't want to be negative towards any other brands. However, <laughs> I'm like, I don't, am I, Lauren, can I answer this question? I don't want to be unfair to any other other chocolatiers out there, but I do. Yeah, how about um, how about you just say what your favorite other brand is, okay. aside from, and then your favorite maybe Mars brand. Okay, we'll do that. We'll do that. Um, so I would say if I were to have something that is not a well, see, most of the pieces I I didn't know this, but most of the chocolates that are my favorite happen to be Mars products, which I didn't know until I started working here. Um, so one of my favorite candies, if I can't have Ethel M, I have um, the peanut butter m &Ms. That's one of my favorites. And another favorite I have is the, um, the Dove chocolate, the Dove dark chocolate. That's also my favorite, which is also a Mars brand. Um, I have one other 
So did um I forgot the guy who made this, but did the person who made the company did he like actually make Snickers? Did he like make the M and M's, or was that just like a reproduction of it? Okay, yeah. Um, so Frank uh, and Ethel is his mom and dad, and they created the Mars Company. So they helped make the Snicker bars, and he worked there too. So they kind of worked together. Um, they did Snicker bars and M and M's, and then I. I don't know which grandkids they were, but I know that when their grandkids got old enough and they worked for the company, they started Snick the um, Starburst and Skittles is also a Mars product and they brought that in. Um, but yeah, he, he definitely helped with those uh, chocolates. And we actually make a one pound Snicker bar at this factory. It's called the Cut and Share and it's literally like this big. It's like really, Bye. really thick. My yeah. favorite chocolate candy is a Snickers. I cool. like absolutely love Snickers. Awesome. Milky Way. Milky Way is also my favorite. I always loved Milky Way. Those are so good. And that's a Mars product too, which I didn't realize until I worked here. All right, cool. You guys have such good questions. All right, so now we're gonna get into the fun facts about the beans again. And we're gonna talk a little bit more in depth about how we source the beans. So we only get our um, beans from Brazil, Indonesia, and West Africa, because that makes a really good blend and we can control the quality really well with that blend. So it stays uh, uniform, basically the same all the time. So I have a cool bowl to show you. This is what the beans actually look like. And again, they're the size of an almond. And I'm gonna crack one open so you can really see the detail of the bean. So let me get the one I, I picked out this one because it really shows the detail. So see right here how it's kind of shiny underneath the shell. So we're gonna, oh, you can see how bad my cuticles are. <laughs> um, so I'm gonna be really quiet and listen. right off. So when you crack open the bean, this is what it looks like on the inside. So see, it kind of get crumb all over my hand, right? If I were to press this, it just crumbles, watch. So what happens is the beans have to get sorted, okay? So we put them in this cool board, and then we shut it and we slice through them and break them open so that we can see what's inside. And what we're looking for is that dark brown color that I showed you. The dark brown color means it's perfectly fermented and it's gonna make a high quality chocolate. So we only source from beans that have that coloring. Um, the other beans can be used for making chocolate, we just don't source from them. So once we pick out the beans that we want, we ship them to Elizabethtown, Pennsylvania, and that's where they get roasted to bring out all the flavor. After they're roasted, they can then be ground or chopped into nibs. So if you've ever heard of a nib, a nib is basically the chopped bean after it's roasted. And that's what this looks like. You can actually buy these in like the grocery store and like the health food section. It'll say whole cacao, 100% cacao beans or nibs, also known as nibs. And you can put them in your ice cream. Uh, they're basically gonna taste like a strong, chocolate, almost like a coffee bean. It's very similar to coffee again, um, but it depends on if you like that. Again, I've built up a very strong tolerance. <laughs> so my favorite new way to eat cacao nibs, I usually put on my ice cream or in um, my yogurt, or sometimes I put it in my oatmeal. But recently I had discovered this really good pancake mix that I love. It's chocolate flavored, of course. <laughs> and so I just sprinkle the cocoa nibs in the pancake batter and I cook it on the stove and it's so yummy. All right, so then once we grind up all of those cocoa beans into a liquid that's known as chocolate liqueur, and that's basically 100% bean. Now I've actually gotten to try that. I tried a tiny little drop, probably about maybe, hmm, I probably tried about that much, okay? Very, very small amount. And it was so bad. It was so bad. It tasted like I put a spoonful of coffee grounds in my mouth mixed with leather and tobacco. Very, very strong. Didn't like it at all. But I could still tell eventually if we added a lot of cream and sugar and butter to that, that it would be chocolate. 
<laughs> so what they do is they separate cocoa butter from cocoa solids and then they re-blend it. So earlier we were talking about white chocolate and what makes it white chocolate, right? Basically when you press beans, you can get the beans and just kind of press them. The drippings from that would be chocolate because beans are 50% cocoa butter and 50% is cocoa solid. So when they're making the white chocolate, they only use one half, which is the cocoa butter. Then they add some cream, some sugar, a little hint of vanilla, and that's the base of white chocolate. And again, it has to have only, it has to have at least 20% to be called a white chocolate. Otherwise it's just a white confection. Now milk chocolate is gonna go through the crumb oven process that we kind of touched base on when we ate the white or the, the milk chocolate heart. Um, it basically, we take milk powder and we put it in a compressed oven and we kind of caramelize that together and mix it together. So it makes that delicious, smooth, creamy milk chocolate. And then of course, dark chocolate. Dark chocolate starts out at 35% and goes higher. Our dark chocolate is considered a semi-sweet. So it's 54% cacao. All right, any questions so far? So one of the pieces that we're having today is gonna be an enrobed piece. And what that means is that picture there that you see with the chocolate kind of flooding down, that is a big trough. It's connected to a tank and a pump. That pump pulls the chocolate up to that trough, constantly creating a curtain of chocolate. But underneath that chocolate curtain is a tray. It's catching all the chocolate dropping down. That creates a pool. So when the pieces go through, they swim through the pool and through that waterfall of chocolate and get covered on all sides but the excess chocolate just falls back down because the conveyor belt's made out of wire. So the chocolate just falls right through back into the tank. So it comes right back up and nothing is wasted. Alrighty guys, we're gonna get back into some more chocolate. And if you guys have any questions, feel free to let me know. All right, up next is our peanut butter. But if you didn't know it was peanut butter, just by looking at it, what would you guess that it would be? This, this probably sounds kind of weird, but like maybe like a red velvet. Ooh, that would be good. Good I guess. Thought, I like that answer. Caramel or marshmallow. Caramel or marshmallow. Okay. I felt like it would like probably be like a cinnamon or like something like a spice. Oh, cool. Yeah, this one, a lot of people look at the color and they think maybe it's going to be a fruit because it's red. So I, I often have a lot of people thinking that it's going to be raspberry or strawberry, but then when you smell it, something doesn't smell like raspberry. You know, it smells like peanuts, right? It smells like peanut butter. I'm going to definitely do the nose trick on this one because that's really fun with this piece. This is my second favorite piece that we make. We actually make our own peanut butter from scratch. And when they make the peanut butter, it just smells like peanut butter everywhere. It's so good. So it has a really rich, creamy texture. Um, while you guys are enjoying the piece, I'll talk to you about how we get the color on the chocolate. So what we do is, hang on one second, let me get water. What we do is we have to prep the mold first. So it's kind of like a transfer sheet. We take the molds and we set them up and then we have this cocoa butter coloring, which basically is cocoa butter. And then we add some food coloring to it. And they have a really cool airbrush gun, kind of like a, like a spray can or something, right? And they're gonna airbrush the molds first in a nice thin layer. And then they let that cool. Once it's set up, they're able to make the peanut butter and go through the one shot depositor. So with this, it's gonna have the filling and the chocolate shell. So there's two tanks. One will have the filling, one will have the chocolate shell and they intertwine with nozzles and it shoots down this double straw at the exact same time into the mold. So it does the filling, peanut butter and the chocolate shell. When it goes through the cooling tunnel, after it cools, when they pull out the piece, the cocoa butter has melted together with the chocolate. And that's why when they pull it off the mold, the coloring is on the chocolate now instead of in the mold. And that's why it doesn't have like a weird taste or anything. It just tastes like chocolate because we, we use cocoa butter. All 
All right, any questions about this one? Did it change your favorite so far? Um, well, how does the peanut butter and the chocolate not mix together? Like the filling and the chocolate not mix together? Very good question. So what we do to make sure that that doesn't happen is that the chocolate is perfectly tempered. And what that means is we heat it up to about eight, 108 degrees, and then we slowly cool it down to about 86 degrees for milk or 88 for dark. And by perfectly tempering the chocolate, it has like a thicker texture. Also, the double nozzle. So basically there's a, a straw within like a straw, it kind of looks like this, right? So the inside is connected to the peanut butter only. The outside is connected to the chocolate shell. So when the filling comes down, the filling is pushing out, causing the shell to kind of push out to the sides of the mold and go up. And then it stops filling with the chocolate or stops the filling and then it tops it off with chocolate. So it's kind of like a timing effect too. And they can change the timing of the nozzle machine based on the shape of the piece and how much filling versus chocolate ratio that they want. So um, everything is kind of measured to get the right thickness. They program the machine and then it drops just the right amount of chocolate to where it would kind of be pushed out to the sides as the filling is being pushed in, if that makes sense. Good question, I love it. Any other questions? Do you guys ever clean the machines? Every single day after everything that we make. Absolutely, yep. Everything has to be swab tested as well to make sure that there's no traces of nuts. So if we were to be making, let's say, a peanut butter heart, let's say we were making the hearts, right? We made the white chocolate and now we wanna to switch to the solid milk chocolate. So they have to sanitize and clean, but basically it takes about five to 10 minutes to do that transition. What they do is they just have a separate enrober or a separate molding line and they just kind of switch them out. But if they were to be making, say something that has nuts and they have to transfer to something that doesn't have nuts, it actually takes about three hours because of how in depth they go into cleaning every single little piece, the conveyor belts underneath the cooling tunnel, sanitizing everything so that there's no traces of nuts before they start something that doesn't have nuts in it. So does that mean you could still eat the chocolate without nuts, even if, so like, if I was allergic to peanut butter yeah. or nuts, which I'm not, I could still have the other chocolate. I just wouldn't have the peanut butter and that'd be okay. Um, or does that for some on people, yes. Right. Yes, absolutely. So some people are so highly allergic that even if they were in the mm -hmm. same room or if it was on the same conveyor belt, they're still mm -hmm. not able to have it. But there are some people that aren't so highly allergic to where they could. So we try to make sure that it's so clean that the majority of the people that do have nut allergens, they usually can eat their chocolate. But if it's too severe, then they just don't like taking the chance and they won't do it. But I would say it's, a, it's a, not a preference, it's a personal it depends on how highly alerted they are. Good questions, guys. All right, up next, we have the pecan caramel rapture. So let's go ahead and rinse our palettes. So this one has a really cool, crazy texture inside. So really think about all the different texture that you're noticing when you bite into this piece. So this one has a lot of texture going on, right? There's that soft, chewy caramel. And then there's little cluster of pieces of nut everywhere. And you'll notice you'll, you'll get like a little bit of a nut in every single bite. That was very important is one of the things that comes into factor when we're making chocolate is how is the bite going to feel? You know, is it going to have a nut in every single bite that you take of this piece? We want to make sure that those nuts are spread perfectly to where when you bite into it, you do get a little bit of nut and caramel and chocolate every single time, not just all the nuts at one time and then chocolate or caramel later. So this piece is really fun. It's a really cool way of how they make it. 
But before we get into that, let's talk about all the different flavor notes. This one's a little bit different. So you're gonna notice a lot more flavor notes at the same time. This one goes into dairy, right? Because of the butter from the caramel, but also from the milk chocolate. It also goes into sweet aromatics because of uh, the caramel. So you're gonna get kind of like butterscotch, maybe a little bit of honey. My favorite category, which when you look at it on the flavor wheel, on the earthy tone, you really don't want any of those things in your chocolate. <laughs> But sometimes it can taste that way or it'll taste like that smell, if that makes sense. So it's not that it has that flavor, it has the taste that reminds you of that smell. So for me, when I look at the earthy category, I always kind of place it in straw or hay or you know maybe wood. Uh, what do you guys notice? Do you guys notice anything in the earthy tone? Well, I mean, it kind of like for me, the earthy tone would be you taste what you smell, you know, because taste and smell are such big part. So I'm like, I'll smell something and then later my mom will make something and then I'll be like, hey, this tastes like the smell of. Exactly. Like the exactly. And that happens to me all the time. Very cool. You've got a good nose. <laughs> <laughs> I do that, then my mom just tells me that I'm weird. It's a, it's a cool weird though. It's a cool word. My mom had a super nose. Like it was crazy. I actually remember one time she was talking to my sister on the phone and she's like, are you eating chocolate? And my sister's like, mom, you can't smell that I'm eating chocolate. She's like, but you're eating chocolate. I can tell I can smell it. And she's like, we're on the phone. And my mom's like, but you didn't answer the question. Are you? And she's like, yes, I'm eating chocolate, mom. Like, I don't know how <laughs> she could smell that my sister was yeah, eating my, chocolate. I was my like, brother's. <laughs> My brother has a super nose. We're downstairs in the basement. And he can, he's just like, he sniffs the air. He's just like, Is it, are those chocolate chip cookies? And I'm just like <laughs> sniffing the air. And I'm just like, where do you find that? We went upstairs. My mom's pulling a fresh batch of chocolate chip cookies out of the oven. I'm like, what? <laughs> That's, he's got a superpower. That's a, it's a good thing to have. <laughs> Alrighty, so what did you guys think about the texture on this one, right? Very different compared to the pieces we've had so far. I didn't think I would like this one because I'm not usually a big fan of nuts and chocolate, mm -hmm. but just the ratio between the caramel, the chocolate, and the nuts, I think it's one of my favorites. Awesome. Very cool. Yeah, this one has that nice soft texture, right? It's really good and really smooth. So let's talk about how they make this piece. So this is kind of like a layered piece. So what they do is they take the uh, pecans, the crushed, the crushed pecans, chopped, they're like chopped, they're chopped pecans. And they, we get them from California. And so they're already roasted and we put them on the conveyor belt. They cover the conveyor belt with the crushed almonds. And then what we do is we have to make the caramel first actually. So we melt down all the ingredients in the caramel in the copper kettle gas heater. We use copper kettles because copper holds a truer temperature, which means it's going to disperse the heat more evenly throughout the batch. And then once we mix all the caramel to about 239 degrees, then we're going to cool it down to about hundred. We want it to still be kind of runny and gooey. So then we take that caramel and we pour it into a trough, very similar to the enrobing machine that you saw on the slide previous. So there's this big trough and we pour the caramel in and the caramel just kind of flows on top of the pecans. Then they let that set up. As it's setting up, it's gonna grab all the pecans that it's laying on. And then what they do is once it's set up, they just kind of pull it apart to the right size. And then they go through the enrobing machine and get covered on all sides. And it'll have a fan in that machine. So once they go through that curtain of chocolate and the pool of chocolate to get covered, there's a fan that blows air onto it to smooth it out. And that's one of the most important parts because with the nut, they're kind of like all jagged and like bumpy. So we wanna make sure that the caramel gets down all those little cracks and crevices so it's a completely sealed piece. So the air blows air onto it to smooth it out and then it will go through a cooling tunnel. So this is kind of like a layered piece. If you do have a little bit of it left, you can also try turning, turning it upside down and taking a bite that way. It kind of changes how it tastes. So for fun, Lauren, I was thinking maybe, because I know so much about chocolate at this point, let's not show them the last slide until they guess what it is. 
Love it. All right, cool. So chocolate tears. You are now professional eaters, just like I am. So we're not going to tell you what that last one is. I'll show you what it looks like. This is the one that we're going to be eating next, the purple heart. So just by looking at it, what do you think it's going to be? Maybe something like fruity. Okay, maybe fruity. What else? It looks like it's dark chocolate. Yes, absolutely. So it's dark on one side. You can see that. And see, sometimes when you look at the bottom, you'll notice like it has a little bitty kind of belly button. That's that one shot depositor did the filling in the chocolate shell all at one time. And then we have that cocoa butter spray on it. Sometimes yeah, it's hard to smell. All right, let's go ahead and take a bite. It smells almost like lime. It's like a lime flavor. Ooh. Or a lemon or like summer. It smells like summer. Like summer. Like summer. I love that. I always say that. I always say this is definitely a summer piece. It's very sassy and it kind of bites back. Mm. So we got some votes for lemon. Lemon, lime. Very cool. All right, let's go ahead and reveal what chocolate this is. You guys are spot on. It is the lemon satin cream. But the reason why I wanted to trick you is because the shape of it's not always like this. We just dressed it up for Valentine's Day, so it's all cute. But normally, it looks like, where's my box? Yes. Normally, it looks like this one right here. And it has a cool little like lemon leaf on it. This one usually blows you away. You're not expecting it. And it kind of changes everyone's favorite. So I'm kind of curious, did some of you guys change your favorite after trying this one? No? <laughs> I think my favorite is a pecan one. Cause I really like caramel. Yeah. Um, caramel and nuts just go, go so well together. And then the chocolate just envelops it and makes it so much better. Awesome. I love how you described that. That's so cool. Yeah, the pecan rasher is a really, really good one. The texture is really, really fun on that one. I think the pecan is also my favorite. I was actually debating not trying it because usually I really do not like nuts in my chocolate, but it tasted really nice. Awesome. Thank you so much for sharing that. You know, sometimes it is really hard to try new things. And it's really important to kind of, you know, just remember, like, you don't have to take a big bite. And, you know, if you don't want to be on camera, you can always turn your camera off and just kind of, <laughs> but it's, oh, my mom always told me it's very important to try new things and then try them more than one time because you got to give things sometimes a second chance before you kind of start liking that flavor at first, kind of be like, mm, no, I don't like it. But then second time around, you're like, hmm, maybe I do like broccoli. <laughs> yeah my um friend we were like she had like fluffy cheetos out or something i can't remember or like those huge cheetos and yeah. ever since i was like six i have just like not been a fan of cheetos like nope i'm sorry i'd rather be with like doritos or like other kinds of chips i just i don't like che cheetos mm -hmm. and she's like nah you have to try these you are going to try these <laughs> and she was like, what was the time you last ate them? And I was like, probably like six or seven. And she told me that your taste buds change when you're like seven or eight. And so they kind of like Ooh. change around. And I think they do that like maybe one more time or something. And that is true. I didn't think it was a real thing, but my mom told me that. She's like, you know, someday you're going to like broccoli. Mm -hmm. Your taste buds change when you get older. And I'm like, that's not true, mom. Well, yeah, it was true. <laughs> yeah. And then I tried the big one. I tried the big cheese it and I was like, I was okay with it. I mean, it wasn't like the worst thing in the world. It was better <laughs> than how I last remembered it. So I haven't really ate many Cheetos since, but yeah. I'd say my favorite Cheeto is probably like the, um, the popcorn Cheeto. It's like, it kind of looks like popcorn, but it's not. And it's like extra fluffy. I don't know. It just kind of like melts in your mouth when you eat it. I love that one. 
<laughs> yeah, and like, especially the spicy one. <laughs> yeah, and like Takis, everyone is like, you have to try Takis, they're so good. <laughs> and my friend actually gave me one to try one day, and I did not like it. I was just like, <laughs> I'm not a very big fan of spice. Yeah. Like, a little kid. You've got to be good. a fan of spice. Let me but, better than Takis. Like, I mean, I didn't really like them. I'm just like, what? Yeah, my right. daughter's obsessed with Takis. Anything spicy. Like, she <laughs> has, I don't know, she just loves spice. <laughs> Any, the like hottest that. chip you can find. Like, she's like, yeah. And I'm like, oh, no, how can you? Doesn't your, and she's like, my stomach hurts. I'm like, well, stop eating hot Cheetos. <laughs> <laughs> all righty guys well that pretty much ends our chocolate tasting do you guys have any other chocolatey questions or any comments or anything you want to share with everybody so i also want to reintroduce um we have zandra and morgan on the line so i quickly introduce them at the beginning zandra is our quality conformance coordinator which means that before the boxes get shipped out to you that's why they're in the perfect heart shapes all the pieces are sealed perfectly zandra kind of monitors that at the henderson site and we also have morgan on the line she is our microbiologist for global quality and food safety so she makes sure that all the chocolates that you try tonight are safe to eat and um, they're good for you to eat. So if you have any questions at all for either of them, um, and Morgan, I will go ahead and add you to the spotlight as well as Zandra. And um, if anyone has any questions, feel free to comment in the chat box or unmute yourself. Um, Morgan and Zandra, if you wanna go over again a little bit more in depth about what you do for Mars, how long you've been with the company, and maybe what your favorite thing about working and doing this position is. Um, Morgan, if you wanna go ahead and start. Yeah, sure, hi guys. So I've been with Mars for five years. Um, I started off um, working in one of our manufacturing sites, managing food safety and working as a food scientist. Um, as I progressed, I kind of took over the micro business. So my job is to really make sure that the food that's going out of our facilities are safe for consumption. <laughs> I interact with our regulatory government. So I interact a lot with the FDA and any other regulatory bodies across the globe. And then a lot of the fun aspects of my job that I get to travel around the world to different countries to go to all of our different manufacturing sites. Um, to meet with our associates there and spend some time learning not only what they're doing, but help them with new product um, takeoffs or new product, um, new equipment installations, things along that line. Hi, everyone. So I've been with Mars for six years. So prior to this position, I was an enrobing operator. So what you ate, like um, the pecan rapture, I used to make that. Yes, that, yes. What's fun about my prior position is that I can try that without any chocolate. It's just caramel and pecan by itself. And it's so good. And then after that, I get to try it with chocolate and it's even better. And then, um, so on this current position, um, so we make sure that everything is good, all the packaging is right, best before date is, and the code date is properly um, on the right position on the boxes. And then we make sure that the micro samples are sent out and it's safe to eat. That's awesome. We got a few questions ahead of time um, regarding you know, the, the requirements, um, maybe the career path you took to get to this position. Um, so what would that be for both of your positions, the requirements to get a job with Mars? And then um, if you had a career path leading up to this in Mars or um, anything like that. Yeah, so I, I guess I can start us there. Um, my career path was, um, predominantly school for a while. So I did biology when I went to undergrad and then I got my um, doctorate in science 
and microbiology. Um, and then I went on to get my master's um, in business administration so that I could link the science with the business. Um, I've worked for Sherwin-Williams and I've worked for Coca-Cola. So if you guys drink Coca-Cola um, sodas or any of those beverages, I um, started there. And then I transitioned um, into my current job. And a lot of it was really around making sure that I worked really hard and I studied really hard, um, but getting mentors as well um, and then getting experience. So sometimes what you'll find as you get older um, is that um, if you take a job, you can always get experience from things um, and you want to make sure that you're getting a wide range of experiences, both hands-on and those that are less tactical to help you. So prior with um, working with Mars, I was actually a contractor. So I was working side by side by, um, with Mars Associates. And then, so I got to see all the processes. I was really hands-on and then I was hired by Mars. And then I was taking um, classes uh, in CSN here, um, College of Southern Nevada. And I took chocolate class because I was really into it. I was passionate about getting to know how to temper chocolate, um, how to temper the cocoa butter, you know, the one with the red spray, the lemon and the peanut butter piece. So I, I get to do that back when I was an old. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. I have a question. How much color ended up getting on you when you do it? Like, did you get covered in color? <laughs> <laughs> yes, especially when it's fully um, like a full coverage, like the peanut butter. So you'll get on your safety glasses and your um, bump cup too. How long would it take to do enough molds for one batch? Um, if it's like the peanut butter piece, I'll say an hour. If it's oh. like um, speckle, it'll be like 20 minutes because that's quicker. Nice, cool. Thanks. <laughs> You're welcome. And then Tammy Jo, do you want to go over how you kind of have an interesting story too about how you started out with FLM chocolates? And I mentioned you've been uh, here for 20 years, so it's yes. pretty amazing. <laughs> it is. It's very, very amazing. Um, I love factories. I love how things are made. And I just really love chocolate. And one of my favorite movies as a kid was Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. So I'd always watch shows like how, how machines work and all the details that go into them. I just was always fascinated about how they work and why they work the way that they do. And I also have a huge passion for chocolate. So when I got older, I decided, hey, you know what? FLM is hiring. Let me go you know, get a job there. And I thought I was gonna be working in the factory part, but I applied for the retail side and I ended up getting hired as the tour guide. However, um, I actually have severe stage fright. Now, no one believes me when I say this because I clearly am able to speak very well in front of people. Sometimes I slur my words, but it's okay. Um, but I didn't really like that I was so shy and scared all the time and I kind of wanted to get out of that. And so I didn't realize it, but they hired me as the tour guide. They saw something in me that I didn't see for myself and with mentors and with the help of some really awesome people along the way, I learned how to conquer that fear and get over my fear of talking in front of people. And now I love it. It's one of my favorite things to do. I love giving the guided tours because I get to tell people about all the details and how they make the machines and how they spray the molds and that kind of stuff and how chocolate in general is made. And so it just kind of like evolved from there and it went from guided tour to apple dipping to photo taking to so many different things. And now it is chocolate tastings. And now it's virtual tastings. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of my journey. <laughs> and I love it. <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah. It's, it's cool how you're 
position can change and transform when you're open yes. to the new opportunities and learning about the different aspects, even if it's not in your exact role, being open to learning about, you know, your coworkers role and your manager's role and people who help you's role, it kind of yeah. just makes you able to grow. So that's awesome. Um, does anyone have any questions for any of these amazing women that we have right now? I know someone asked, how do you become a food safety scientist as a career? You kind of already answered that, Morgan. Um, what is your favorite thing about um, your job right now? Or what's like the coolest thing that you're able to do? That's a hard question. <laughs> yeah, it is. That's, hard. That's a tough one. Um, I'd say the coolest part of my job is traveling. So unfortunately with COVID, I've been home um, for, I have, obviously I haven't left the country since 2019. Um, mm -hmm. But prior to COVID, I was probably out of the country two weeks out of every month. Wow. Um, and it's pretty fun to get to travel and explore um, because you're not just traveling for work. So I've gone to some pretty cool countries. Um, I've gotten to go explore um, Europe during the summer and on some of the best trips, I get to take my family with me. So um, it's really a great time just to not only get to see the associates, but also to get to explore the countries as well. That's amazing. Yeah, because if um, I'm not sure if I mentioned it before, but you work for all of Mars Wrigley, which is our parent company. Um, Tammy Jo, Zandra and I work at our Henderson location, which is just at the Lemon Chocolates. But Morgan really works for all the other brands we talked about. Um, do you work with Pet as well? Um, I partner with them, but I don't oversee Pet. I do oversee Kind. Um, okay. So yeah, I do get to get a, get my hand on Kind a bit, as well as um, Goodness Knows. Awesome. Ooh, Goodness Knows is good. <laughs> <laughs> we used to make that here. I miss it. Yeah. <laughs> Awesome. So we have time for another question if anyone has any questions. Otherwise, we can go ahead and close it out. And while we give you all a minute, I'll go ahead and share our discount code that we are so happy you all joined us. Um, if you want to go on FLM.com and use the code virtual at checkout, you'll get 15% off your purchase. So that's for any if you want to do another virtual tasting, if you want to get anything that you like tonight that you tried, go ahead and um, do that and you can get 15% off. And if there's no other questions, I want to thank you all for joining us tonight. We had so much fun. It was super interactive and fun. And um, I know Tammy Joe had a lot of fun. And yeah, thank you all so much for joining us. We hope to see you again soon. Bye, everybody. Bye, thank you. You're welcome.